Father, we are so thankful that your word shows us Christ, and so we are thrilled that we can sing this song. Before we look at your word corporately, before we dive into uh, the very word that reveals your glory, your greatness. And so we know that even this prayer request, which was sung in the form of a song, is, is a prayer that you can't help but answer because it's in exactly in line with your will. Uh, that you would glorify your Son in the hearts and minds of your people. And that GBC as a church would shine, shine brightly in, in the midst of a dark and perverted generation as we hold forth the word of life, as we live out faith and repentance, as we showcase your power, your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, your righteousness, your justice. And so, Lord, we ask for grace as we look at your word so that we would benefit rightly, that you would get the glory, that all of, the, that all of our, our, the heart work that needs to happen in our inner man would pave the way for you to get glory in, in Phoenix through the testimony of this congregation. And so glorify your Son in us, and then as we go about the life that you have ordained for us, we would showcase the glory of your Son to a lost and dying world. And this is our prayer, Lord, for your glory and your glory alone. In your name we pray, amen. Well, grab a seat and, uh, and grab your Bibles. And turn in your Bibles to Psalm 51. We are going to Go back to Psalm 51 this morning, and as you're turning your way to Psalm 51, I'll, I'll just quickly remind you why we are in this psalm. Some of you who are visiting or new, um, it might, you might not know from the appearances of it, at least this week and last week, we're actually in the middle of a study of the Gospel of Mark. And we've finished the intro to Mark, and we've seen how John the Baptist's ministry was a ministry of repentance. He preached a baptism of repentance, and Mark could also summarize the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a, a ministry that was demanding repentance and faith in the gospel of God. And so that's an appropriate summary of Jesus' message. Repent and believe in the gospel. I think sometimes we as Christians or as, uh, as a church, sometimes it's easy to not spend the appropriate time and maybe perhaps we are under-equipped or ill-equipped to think about how to deal with sin as a believer. Post-conversion, sin. How do we deal with that? How do we think about that? And in fact, as Jesus preached re uh, repentance and faith in the gospel, of course, he's preaching that to a lost and dying world, but that also becomes the message throughout the gospel of Mark, and we're going to see that the disciples are going to be examples for us of what it means to learn that lesson of what it means to live out faith and repentance, because that must be lived out beyond what we began with that conversion or what we currently experience now. We must grow in our faith we must grow in our repentance. If we do not, we will not be able to follow Jesus Christ on the way. It is too difficult, and none of us have arrived. If you think of the exhortation of the Apostle Peter, he says in 2 Peter chapter 1, supplying all diligence, add to your faith, moral excellence, moral excellence, brotherly love, and he goes on through about eight virtues and says, if these are yours and they are increasing, so we need those virtues, and they need to be growing, and so our faith must be increasing. And so the reason why we're in Psalm 51 is because this is a great expression of post-conversion faith and repentance. How do we respond to our sin? David's our example last week and this week, and so I titled this Living Out Faith and Repentance. Repentance and faith, how do we live it out? And again, that title is probably wouldn't even be the title if it wasn't because I was using this as an, as, a, as an instruction for us to benefit from Mark. Uh, 
Uh, it'd probably be a different title if it was just purely Psalm 51, but in light of using it uh, as an illustration and as a, an instruction, as a template, as an encouragement to be able to prepare our hearts to, to learn what it means to live out repentance and faith like the disciples in the Gospel of Mark, that's, that's a helpful, helpful way to approach Psalm 51. And so last time we looked at verses 1 through 9, and, and, um, and I, I mentioned that we would be relatively short in the last two stanzas, and I probably, I was probably about 10 minutes off my pace. I thought, oh, we'll wrap this up, and then sure enough, I couldn't get to the last two stanzas. And so what do you know? I have a whole week with verses 10 through 19, and it felt like a zip file in my hands. I'm trying to just kind of keep that thing contained. And the longer I'm studying verses 10 to 19, it just starts expanding and expanding. So it's going to be about four more weeks to finish. Just kidding. No, we, I really, do, I really uh, intend to finish the psalm, but uh, don't call me a liar if we don't. That's, that's my goal. Um, but I, just, I was just blown away once again by the incredible power and clarity of God's Word and how it just ministered to me time and time again throughout this week. And so, particularly, verses 10 to 13, uh, and that's probably going to get a little bit uh, more of the lion's share of our attention this morning, but I do intend to look at verses 10 through 19, so we can finish up this incredible psalm. Let's read it together, I mean, just in the sense of follow along with me as I read. I want to read the whole thing so it's all in our minds, because what we looked at last week, we cannot be lost, we cannot forget it. So I'll just do a quick review here in a second, but let's get the whole thing in front of us. Starting in verse 1, David writes this, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me no wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. And then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Well, as I mentioned, repentance and faith, they're the fundamentals of Christianity. And so like Coach Lombardi holding out the football, saying this is a football, preparing his team for a new season, it's as though Christ begins in the Gospel of Mark telling us as Christians, do not lose sight of the fundamentals. We must master the fundamentals of Christianity, which is repentance and faith. And so the example of David is very helpful here because David be becomes a model for us of what it means to live out faith and repentance. And as we saw last time in verses 1 through 9, a real repentance on the part of a believer 
is going to be marked by self-indictment. I mean, this is absolutely foundational, fundamental to Christianity. Uh, It's what I look for in my own heart. It's what I look for in counseling. It's what I look for in in relationships and in fellowship as we were talking about our sin and our flaws or our crimes against God. Is there self-indictment? The sinner must be willing to indict self, condemn self, and write God's name of all wrongdoing. In other words, a part of repentance is that I would always point to myself as the problem and God has done no wrong, no matter what circumstances, no matter what the consequences I have incurred or he has brought into my life, God is absolutely free of wrongdoing to the point that David would say, God would be right to have condemned me in hell forever for that one wayward inclination of my soul. That's self-indictment, and that writes God's name. And so, as we saw in verses 1 through 9, this self-indictment was marked by a couple of things. First of all, first verses 1 through 4, it was marked by Godward sorrow. David's sorrow was just wrapped up in the offense that he was against God. He realized, I've, I've sinned against God, I've offended God. That's where the crime is, that's where the offense lies, is with God. He, he's, he's, he's not wallowing in horizontal sense of offense, he is consumed with a vertical awareness, I've offended a holy God. The second mark of this self-indictment is a desire for something we don't have, namely, inner purity. And this is not, a, um, this is not to undo the gospel of justification. David boasted rightly in God's righteousness, in divine righteousness that was given to him, but he's longing for a real, practical, functional, internal purity that if it had been there, he would have never sinned in the way that he did as described in the, in the historical heading here. There's a desire for inward purity. There's a, a longing for something that he uh, doesn't, that he didn't have. And in fact, when he starts to cry out uh, for this purification, he's actually willing to embrace all the consequences of his sin that God would have brought into his life without any regret. He's not looking back saying, oh, if only I hadn't sinned with Bathsheba, if only I hadn't sinned against Uriah, man, my life would be so much easier. His, his repentance isn't motivated by self-comfort or how much easier his life would have been if, his, if there wasn't a coup against him, if he didn't have to leave the palace and run from Absalom and all of the decades of consequence of his sin. He embraced all of that as the purification for his, his heart. And that means, that means that real repentance is marked by a desire for internal holiness that says, I would rather be miserable than unholy. Disappointed with circumstance? That's okay as long as I'm not displeasing to Christ. Painful relationships? Well, that, that's not my desire, but that's, that's, that's okay. I'm totally okay with that if, 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 if I'm pleasing to God. The desire for inward holiness and inward purity is just the plea all the way through verse five, verses 5 through 9. And so now we, we're going to dive in here in verse 10. Verses 10 to 19, uh, the, way, the, the way I've worded this, the way that David lives out repentance and faith is that there's this plea for restoration. And, and, and the first thing, uh, the first mark of a true plea for restoration is, is a real spiritual dependence. Look at verses 10 to 13. As we read this, you might have noticed that the first three verses have six commands, entreaties pleading, begging of God for these requests to be answered. Two positive, two negative, and then two more positive. Notice in verse 10, create. 10b, renew. Verse 11a, do not cast. 11b, do not take. Verse 12, restore. 12b, sustain. I mean, all the way through these three verses, you have six pleas that that David is making of God, saying, God, won't you do this? You don't You don't repent this way until you are utterly convinced of your spiritual bankruptcy. This is not the prayer of somebody who believes they have some sort of ability and that what they need to do is just make up for a wrong. 
David is just getting after it. And this is an expression of spiritual dependence because he's asking God to do something that only God can do because he knows it's totally beyond his pay grade. It's way beyond his ability. 10a, create in me a clean heart, O God. What an important word, create. Hebrew language has a couple, at least a couple of different words for create. One could be used of God or man, and we probably would translate that more often than not, make. You can make something. You can fashion something. Man and God can make or fashion something. It's using something that exists, and you kind of manufacture something. So we, we make stuff. We start with raw materials, and we make something. We, we make a cake. But no mom in the history of the kitchen has ever created a cake. I created a cake. Oh, get your own dough, your own flour, your own batter. Just create your own cake. The word create has the idea of creating something out of nothing. And that's the word used here. And it's only used of God as the subject. This is not something that man can participate in. This is creation, not just forming, not just fashioning, not just producing. This is creation. Something needs to be created that currently doesn't exist. So David is saying, Lord, I I look at what just happened with Bathsheba and with Uriah, and I know that that came from my heart. That's the overflow of my own heart. So I'm asking for you to create something that doesn't currently exist, namely a, very practically, practically speaking, a clean heart. This is not a denial of justification or imputed righteousness. This is an acknowledgement that his current sin nature has produced effects and that the current state of David's heart is not pleasing to God, and the answer is he needs a divine work. It's a powerful word. The subject is invariably God in the Scriptures when this word is used. And so David is asking God to create this clean heart. John Calvin said this. He said, by employing the term create, he expresses his persuasion that nothing less than a miracle could affect his reformation and emphatically declares that repentance is the gift of God. But by the term create, which he had previously employed, he acknowledges that we are indebted entirely to the grace of God, both for our first regeneration and in the event of our falling for subsequent restoration. That's exactly right. I mean, imagine if the Christian life were one of God graciously turning you from your pursuit of hell and your love of self and your worship of man and all that goes along with who you were before Christ. And then from there on out, it's you accomplishing repentance. Wow. That's exhausting. And that's perpetual failure. Here's a repentance that is divinely empowered. Here's a repentance that is fueled by the hand of the sovereign. And here's a repentance that is real because David knows that what's called for is beyond his own ability to create. This is not something you can fashion in a theological lab. This is something produced by the hand of a gracious God. And so repentance starts with spiritual dependence, seeking from the Lord something that I could never have accomplished. So when we think about it, Creation, uh, sorry, salvation is a work of creation, and sin is then a work of destruction. Our sin is destructive. Our sin causes harm, it does damage, and it comes from an an impure heart, a heart that needs to be recreated and renewed. And so here, David, even though he, his heart in the, in the Old Testament sense of the word regeneration, which is a circumcised heart, his heart has already been circumcised. He, he loves God's law. He's been transformed. He has a heart after God's own heart. He loves God's will. And yet here he is in a notable moment of sin after his own conversion, looking to God to recreate, to create in him a clean heart that he does not currently have. This is a doctrine that is kind of being eradicated out of some reform circles right now. It seems like in a lot of reform circles of theology, um, where, and I mentioned this 
uh, last week. It's almost like there's a, it's common to have a complaint about talking about sin too much. And usually the way this works in the discussion of sanctification is uh, usually there's a complaint like, hey, wait, it sounds like you're, John, that you're, you're, you keep harping on the fact that you keep sinning or that there's still sin in your life as a Christian as though depravity, as though we're just, depravity is pervasive and you, God never overcomes it. Well, of course God never, he totally overcomes depravity. That's what salvation's all about. But the question is, is after your conversion, has God glorified us? Of course not. Of course we haven't been glorified. And so we're still looking for a work to happen that still needs to be done. We are still, post-Christ, unable to accomplish faith and repentance on our own. But for the first time in our existence, we actually have a God-given ability to have power over the sin that once held us fast. And so, David is sitting here excited, dependent, broken, spiritually bankrupt, anticipating the answer of this prayer, looking to God to empower him in his obedience. And he turns and he also says this, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. The, the, the steadfast spirit is, is a spirit that is established. It's steadfast. It's, it's, it's permanent. It's enduring. There's a readiness. There's a preparedness. This is a spirit that is ready to act. It's a, it's a spirit that endures and keeps pursuing obedience. It's not fluctuating. It's not frenetic. It's not passionately excited about obedience, but just, okay, I gave up, you know, after 10 seconds of trying really hard, and I'm over, I'm over that. It's steadfast. It's focused. And so David knows the fickleness of his own ways. He knows his own, own inability. He knows that he's fickle, and he's looking to the Lord to produce this steadfast spirit. Here's an application. When you think about verse 10. You think about how we need to apply this to our own hearts. You know, to the degree that I would flatter myself and vainly imagine that sin was just something circumstantial or merely external, as though it didn't come from my own heart, then to that degree, I'm not going to be practicing David's request right here. You understand that, right? Like th this, this request comes from the sheer conviction that I know where my sin came from and it's not the relationship, it's not the other person, it's not my circumstance, it's my own heart. And coupled with that, the conviction that I don't have the power to change my own nature. And so David appeals to God, spiritual dependence. This steadfast spirit is for sure a mark of repentance you ever had one of those seasons in your Christian walk where you can just tell your heart is not settled? It's bouncing to and fro, and you can see a fickleness, you can see a waywardness, you can start to wrestle your heart to the ground with some degree of biblical conviction, and then it just feels like it slips through your fingers and you're right back to the frenetic, ungrounded thinking. You feel like you're tossed to and fro, and you're thinking like, well, yeah, yeah, I want to grow, but... But man, there's all these other problems we've got to solve. and You're just distracted. It's wisdom from below that produces um, all sorts of disorder and every evil thing. You can memorize Bible verses and still cohabitate with selfish ambition. That's boasting, lying against the truth, James says. But the wisdom from above, it's first of all pure and then peaceable. I mean, when you see repentance, like David's describing here, it produces peace, rest, dependence on the Lord, steadiness. The heart becomes quieted. It embraces God's providence as good, not just as good, but as better, not just as better, but as best. And it knows that the circumstances that I'm in are actually unimprovable because, Lord, what I need is a new heart and a steadfast spirit. I want to walk in a way that pleases you. Is that your desire? 
In verse 11, we look at the negatives. David says, don't cast, away, don't cast me away from your presence. Do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. And this is a, certainly a verse that's important to understand properly and in its context. Um, I do want to explain, there's a difference between David's experience of the Spirit and the Gospel uh, than us as a New Testament believer. And this is one of those verses where it's very pronounced. And so it's just worth mentioning that the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit that, that David experienced is actually, uh, there's, there's some important differences than the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we experience. Real quick, let me just mention a, a similarity. Uh, I've already mentioned the term circumcision of the heart. That's the Old Testament term for regeneration, when God makes somebody new. Uh, it's a sp- spiritual surgery. It's, it's not performed with hands or a, a physical scalpel. It's a surgery of the divine God that cuts off the propensity of the soul that goes away from God towards sin. And, and that's, a, that's a, the Old Testament term for regeneration. The Spirit regenerates, and the Spirit performs the circumcision of the heart. That's something that's similar. So David was a, a true saint. He was a, a blood-bought saint. He was anticipating the promises that he was trusting in as revealed in the Old Testament. And so he was regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And if you are in Christ today in the church, you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. So that's the same. However, there's a few things that are different. There's a, new, a newness to the ministry of the Holy Spirit that, that David has not, did not experience in his life. And I'm just going to briefly read to you a few passages in the New Testament because I want to explain this to you. I don't want to just get to 51 verse 11 and kind of explain it away like, well, that doesn't really apply to you. And you're like, what? It's the Bible. What are you talking about? So I'm not explaining it away. I'm just going to explain what what it's like in David's context as as, as opposed to what it's like in our context so that you can understand maybe even how you could pray a similar sentiment of verse 11 but not be confused by what's different. So look at, uh, listen to John 7, verses 37 to 39. Jesus is um, he's at the feast here in Jerusalem, and he cries out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. John goes on to comment about that statement. He says, But th- this he spoke of the Spirit, with, who, with those whom he, uh, sorry, whom, who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And this is a giving of the Holy Spirit in a different sense than the Spirit had ever been given in the Old Testament ministry of the Holy Spirit. So now, Jesus is pointing out to the fact that after my resurrection, there's going to be a new ministry of the Holy Spirit. One of the ways that it's going to be new, according to John 14, is that it's going to be new in its permanence. Listen to John 14, verses 16 to 17. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper, that's referring to the Holy Spirit, because um, Jesus is another like the Father, another of the same kind, they have the same essence, and here's another of the same kind, this is the, the Holy Spirit, who also shares the same essence, and I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever, that is the Spirit of truth, whom the, word, the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And so the the Spirit's always ministering. He's always active. From Genesis 1 on, you can see his ministry. But he says he's, he's with you, but he will be in you. And there's a permanency to this new, this newness of this ministry. The last difference would be the significance of it. The significance of it. The significance of the New Testament ministry of the Holy Spirit is different because it's permanent and it's an indwelling. It's called a down payment, 2 Corinthians 1, Ephesians 1. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. He's a, 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 an engagement ring. That's not the translation, but that is the idea. It's like God saying, I've put my spirit in you because on the day that my son shows up, the fact that you have the spirit now is proof that you will be part of the bride when he gets here. It's a powerful ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be, to have the sealing of the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is the, baptizes us into the church. That's, that's what's even pictured in water baptism, but the spiritual reality is that he makes us members of the New Testament church. That's what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is now, as opposed to when David was alive. So let's go back to the Old Testament, and as you're turning back to Psalm 51, I'll just mention a couple of other things that are different. First of all, when you think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament... You know, the, the Holy Spirit's ministry was, was very functional. 
and it was often short-lived. One example would be Bezalel. Do you remember Bezalel? Not a, not a common, he's not in every, not in every coloring book uh, from the Old Testament. But if you remember Bezalel in Exodus 31, he was the, the, the woodworker, the metalsmith. I mean, the guy, the Holy Spirit comes on Bezalel, and he is just cranking out supernatural quality of furnishings to adorn the tabernacle. That's powerful. I mean, God cared about those details, and he, the Holy Spirit overtook Bezalel to even make what was probably already a natural gifting even greater. Similarly, you can see the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit uh, in a theocracy giving guidance to the king, and you can even see that in a positive sense with Saul in 1 Samuel 10 and in a negative sense, uh, sense with Saul in 1 Samuel 19. And so there's an unbeliever overtaken by the Holy Spirit because it's a theocracy, and Saul is the king of the nation of Israel. And here's David. Of course, he's a believer and Saul wasn't, but as far as the Old Testament ministry of the Holy Spirit he knows, he knows I have sinned against God. And, and where, the, where we could say the similar sentiment to verse 11 would be, Lord, I've grieved your Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve your Holy Spirit anymore. We might have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but we can still grieve him. Ephesians 4 talks about that. And so I just want to explain like, the difference in terminology there. So you, you don't have to look at verse 11 and think, oh, okay, so that means I'm suddenly not saved because I sinned. No, that, that wasn't even true for David. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit was different, and so this wouldn't be, a, a, be able to apply directly to our prayer. But we know that God is intimate with those who walk uprightly, and the relationship with the God whom we love is severed by our sin. Sometimes in a hyper-reformed environment, I've even heard people talk about the relationship with God as though the extent of it is just merely justification. Like, I'm justified. That's all that matters. As, wait, so, so God is no longer displeased with sin anymore? My, my sin actually still displeases God. He's still righteous. And he, he loves me so much, he doesn't want me comfortable in my sin. And so I, don't, I shouldn't want to grieve him, and I shouldn't want to tax the relationship that's how we can praise verse 11. Lord, I don't want to lose out on intimacy with you because you are intimate with the upright, and I want my relationship with you to be unhindered. I want you to be able to dwell comfortably in my soul, so help me clean it up because you alone can be the effective cause to clean up my life so that you can dwell comfortably in my soul. Verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. I mean, this here is the secret to being a zealous Christian. Without Godward sorrow from the first stanza, without a desire for inner purity in the second stanza, and without spiritual dependence, we won't we won't be restored in the joy of our salvation. Because until we realize, until we remember afresh, wow, by nature, I would do nothing but offend a holy God. And here he is with the power and the promise to get me out of it so that I could actually exist to glorify his name. That is a privilege that is beyond what I deserve. So Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And it's not, that, it's not as though we get saved all over again, but there's a sense, isn't it not true, that when you see your sin rightly and you come to a point of repentance, that it's like having the joy of your salvation just like the first time, like, wow, here I am, a speck of dust, not just a neutral speck of dust, a sinful speck of dust in God's creation who offended him once again, and that he would have wiped that out by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross and taken all of my guilt and put it on him, and is now going to bring me out of it so that I can practically please him and glorify him on the face of this planet. That's a source of joy. And again in verse 12b, sustain me with a willing spirit. 
The word willing here comes from a word that means to impel or to, 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 to stir. It, it refers to, to making a voluntary decision. It refers to a voluntary contribution. It's when somebody willingly does something, their, their, their will is inclined that way, and they, they, they choose to do that. So David is actually looking to the Lord to sustain him with a willing spirit. He's saying, Lord, give me a heart, a heart that is passionate to just keep running after you. That's real repentance right there. Some of us, get, we get hung up in repentance because we, we put ourselves in a downward spiral because we, 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 we think that we can muster up a willing spirit on our own. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, that's, that's just who I am. I, I do the right thing. Not David. David says, actually, Lord, would you sustain me with a willing spirit? Because I want to want to do right but I know that my want to do right is actually not going to pull off repentance. And so he can repent of his repentance and start repenting biblically, looking to the Lord to accomplish it. So sustain me with a willing spirit. This is um, the difference between a zealous Christian. Zealous Christians aren't those who are living a theological lie, believing that they can perform for God or do something that uh, he alone can do. Zealous Christians are the humble ones who know their sin clearly. It's ever before them. They are convinced of their spiritual bankruptcy and they live reliant on the Lord and their life daily is full of zeal, of energy. It's unflagging. It's voluntary. It's steadfast. It keeps pursuing the Lord. It keeps pursuing Christ. It keeps dying to self. It keeps serving the needs of the saints. That's a recipe for a zealous Christian right there. And that's exactly where David goes in verse 13. Look at verse 13. This is where the direct commands or the entreaties or the pleading stops, and it starts to make a statement of fact about what's going to happen he says, in light of the, uh, the brokenness of 1 through 10 and the self-indictment, and in light of the dependence in verses 10 to 13, or 10 to 12, sorry, in verse 13, he now says, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. This is what will happen. I will, not I might. I, I, I might. I, maybe I will. I'll teach transgressors your ways. I mean, this experience of true, biblical, real repentance makes David the most zealous evangelist. And in the second line, sinners will be converted to you, maybe even better, it's active in the Hebrew, sinners will turn to you. As a result of David's ministry, sinners will turn to the Lord. I mean, what a profound ministry even this act of repentance had on the nation. As I mentioned last week, it's, a, it's an act of sin that happened privately, and David goes public with it, makes it a hymn that, put, that gets put in the hymnal, the Psalter, and now all the nation worships about the graciousness of God who forgives such magnanimous sins as ours. And what that does for David is it makes him zealous to see others freed from the same chains. Market believers, one of the true marks of real repentance is a zeal to see others delivered from the sins that held us fast. If I've really been delivered from chains that were wrapped around my arms and wrapped around my ankles and they were pulling me down into the depths of hell and I was helpless to avoid the consequence that I so richly deserved and God snapped those chains, do you think I could be indifferent to others repenting as well? Impossible. It's a mark of true repentance. You've been set free from sin's dominion. And you're just bleeding, longing to see others set free from their sin, restored to a proper relationship with God. When we live out faith and repentance, we cannot be indifferent to the spiritual state of others. J.C. Ryle said this, we should labor to make all men see that we have found the pearl of great price and that we want them to find it as well as ourselves. A man's religion may well be suspected when he is content to go to heaven alone. 
It's so true. That is so true. You look at the connection between these six entreaties of spiritual dependence and the outcome being this radical passion and conviction that he's going to teach transgressors God's ways, sinners will turn back to God. That is, a, that is an evangelistic zeal that is the mark of true repentance when you've really been delivered. William M. Taylor was a preacher in the 19th century, and he, he told the story of a criminal who was thrown into prison and had already been indicted and I think was on death row as far as I understand the story. Christians in the area were praying for him, and they were sending their best evangelists to the cell to share the gospel with him, to pray with him, to plead with him to to repent and return. And um, they never touched him. They kind of kept their distance. They talked to him through the cell, through the through the uh, the door. And uh, he just kept getting harder and harder and harder. And every evangelist they sent to him was met with less and less uh, warmth and more and more indifference. Finally, they had a well-known preacher in the um, in the town. Uh, uh, very, very well known to the fact that the criminal actually knew who he was. And so he comes to the cell and just the, lets the, the warden and opens the cell and he just goes in and sits next to the uh, prisoner and just sits down next to him, talks to him like an old friend, starts sharing the gospel with him, talking to him about how profound it would be that God, the holy God in heaven, would send his own son to take on humanity so that he can die in the place of man for sinners. After he shared the gospel with him, he just looked at this, this man and pled with him with emotion and with a zeal. He said, isn't that incredible, my friend, that God would send his son to die for sinners like you and me? And the prisoner started convulsing, weeping. What was notable to this man that he testified before his death was he knew who he was talking to. He knew this was a holy guy. A guy who has it together. And in a social sense, of course, he, he knew that was actually a legitimate difference. I mean, there was an upstanding citizen versus a criminal on death row. And he said, to think of a man like that, putting himself on a level with me, saying, a sinner like you and me. My friends, we are worthless in our evangelism until we live out experience and r- repentance like this. If we don't live out this kind of repentance, we are, we are worthless evangelists. Now, this is, this is Father's Day. So, fathers, this is free. I'm going to give you a little Father's Day exhortation. <laughs> Isn't that how it works on Father's Day and Mother's Day? You start preaching at people, and it's like, oh, wow, thanks, thanks for that. I feel so much better. But, you know, fathers, I just want to challenge you. I, I was thinking about it, and I, was, I think about it this way. I think about the, um, the influence, and we, we've talked about this a lot in our small group recently, the influence that the men of this church have on the body life. As goes the fathers in this church, so goes the church. And I want to just press you, fathers, even just to encourage you, to challenge you, to think about the connection of verses 1 through 12 with this verse 13 in your own parenting. Fathers, you must live out this repentance as described by David, because if you don't, the gospel that your children will somehow end up hearing is going to be a gospel about Christ, but the functionality of it is you need to be a good Christian like Dad. Until you're living out this kind of repentance, the gospel will somehow be Dad's example, not Dad's need for the cross constantly. The gospel is, is going to be lost if we don't model this. And so I, I, I gave you in the outline there just some expressions of spiritual dependence. Verse 10, you could say, recreate my soul. Verse 11, remain with me. Verse 12, restore spiritual fervor. Verse 13, reach sinners through me. And that is indeed uh, what David models for us in this third stanza. 
And this plea for restoration continues, and he, uh, he goes on to talk about what he wants by way of acceptable worship. David is, is not, he's not done yet. He does not want to rest until he can give God acceptable worship. And, and that's what's so important, that we don't stop short of this last stanza. In verses 14 to 19, David describes what acceptable worship really is, and this is so helpful. Verse 14, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. He's turning a corner here to talk about what worship would be acceptable to God and in the presence of God's people. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness. Well, what are you talking about, David? Deliver me from blood guiltiness? I mean, he is guilty of Uriah's blood. Here's what's so shocking about the gospel. He he is actually guilty of Uriah's blood, but what he's pleading for is not a fictional gospel. Um, Act like I'm not guilty, or hopefully you just don't know that I'm guilty. He's asking for God to actually deliver him from the guilt. This is not an emotional plea. We sometimes talk about guilt, and we talk about it as a sense of a guilt, a feeling of guilt, an emotion of guilt. You can feel guilty and not be guilty, You can actually be guilty and not feel it. Don't trust your own feelings about whether you feel guilty. The question is, are you guilty? Yes, David was guilty, and he's looking to God to deliver him from actual, objective guilt before God in his own eyes. And so deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. He knew his guilt, and he knew that God could actually take it away. He's not talking about a fiction. He's talking about a real deliverance from guilt. A label of being guilty from in the category of someone who deserves judgment and consequence, deliver me from that position, from that reality. As a result, then, my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. He knows that he'll be worshiping God because of divine righteousness when God delivers him from guilt. By nature, David was guilty. By virtue of the gospel, he is given a very real status of righteousness, and that's what fuels his worship. Verse 15 continues, O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. And um, here's why he says that, verse 16. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. (laughs) It's a sweet statement right there. Because David knows, look, I've got a whole sacrificial system. I mean, he's the king. He's copied down the entire Torah by hand so he can read it every day as the king. And he's sitting there saying, I... You don't delight in the sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. In other words, oh, I sin with Bathsheba. Oh, sin with Uriah. Okay, got to do this animal, that animal, take care of it by seven days, and then we can you know, sacrifice it, and I can be cleansed, and on my merry way. He knows that's not God's heart. That's not what God's pleased with. Perform crimes against God, go kill animals, and you're on your merry way. He's saying, huh, no, no, that's not what you're after. Some perfunctory ritualist ritual uh religious ritual he says i you do not delight in sacrifice otherwise i would give it if that were what pleased you is just a mere killing of the animal i would gladly do it you are not pleased with burnt offering you think wait i thought god commanded burnt offering well how is he not pleased with it well obviously he's pleased with the sacrificial system because you can skip down to verse 19 and you remember how he concludes the psalm as a result of the restoration, as a result of faith and repentance. If that catches on and when that's successful and sinners are converted to the way of the Lord, well then in that day it's going to be a delight and, the, and God will delight in those righteous sacrifices in burnt offering and whole burnt offering and young bulls will be offered to you on your altar. He's talking about a spiritual revival happening where the sacrificial system is offered in faith and repentance and that would be pleasing to the Lord. So when you go back to verse 16 and he's talking about a sacrificial system that's not pleasing to the Lord, that's, a, that's an external performance of sacrifice without faith and repentance. God's not pleased with that. Implication? Implication? He's not pleased with our marching into church, taking communion, devoid of faith and repentance. What is God pleased with? Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. That's what God wants. God wants. 
That's what he delights in. That's what he's pleased with. Can you please the Lord? Here's the one thing you have that pleases the Lord. Brokenness. Contrition. Regret over the fact that, yeah, there it is. I just drug God's name through the mud again. Lord, that's, that's wicked. And that's got to go. Would you please help? It's a broken and contrite heart, and God will never turn that sacrifice away. I could come with a thousand sacrifices. I could come out with a thousand contributions. None of them please the Lord. The one that pleases the Lord is a broken and contrite heart. That's what the Lord will never turn away. That's what he's always pleased with. I want to just, and I know we were very quick on that last stanza, but I just want to close just with a, with a, with a quick comment. I, I want to just try to describe for you a couple of things. I, I would just say this is a pastoral comment. It's not, it's not an exposition from Psalm 51, um, but just pastorally, by way of, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, one thing I'm really good at naturally is sinning. So I think I can help you in this area. <laughs> and... Um, I just want to say this by way of experience, by way of, uh, as a pastor, as a Christian, as a, hopefully a faithful repenter. There, there's, there's two very typical but yet dangerous tendencies with regard to repentance, and I want to highlight for you. First of all, I see this in my own heart, and I see this in counseling quite often. It's the superficial response. It's superficial repentance. There's a tendency at times where we can be glib and casual in our response to sin. And this response to sin lacks conviction. It lacks real conviction, real sobriety. I've seen people acknowledge sin, maybe even serious sin, maybe even a season of serious sin. And it's just almost like, yeah, yeah, it's really bad. And, but no, I, I repented on Tuesday, you know, 10, 19 a.m. Yeah, it's just right there. I wrote it down. Yeah, repented. Good. Got it. Moved on in my merry way. So that's over. And it's like, really? I mean, I understand that you could have clarity and you could have brokenness over sin in a moment. I get that. But there's a glibness and a casualness. Like, you were dominated by sin for years and then you just, it just evaporated? I mean, let's be honest, my friends. Idols do not fall over on their own. They don't just melt. They don't just turn to dust. And so there's a superficial response to sin that's just always concerning. I get very concerned about response to sin that lacks conviction. The other response, the other dip- dangerous, but typical response would be the, a morose response response to sin. This would be the one that's moping and self-absorbed. It's a response to one's sin that lacks joy, that lacks joy. Did you notice in this psalm, I mean, if you counted the numbers of references to joy, rejoicing, singing, and then you also see the very clear statements of, I know my transgression, my sin is ever before me, against you and you only I have sinned. And the absolute desperation and dependence, I mean, it should be very clear from Psalm 51 that it is not lacking in either conviction or joy. A conversion or a response to a season of sin for a Christian that lacks joy or conviction is always suspect. I remember talking to a friend who had just come to our church, back at the church I formerly served at, He'd uh, spent a couple days with, a, with, a, with one of our seminary students. He was uh, on a job, on the job training with this guy. And so he spent a couple days on the road driving from job site to job site as they were uh, between doing work responsibilities. They started talking about the gospel. And this young man um, came to me and he was very gripped by his sin. He was completely torn up about his sin. And just, he just was like, in a con- you know, just weeping constantly. And he just was just beside himself. And uh, I'm like, man, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's healthy, an intense response to sin. But there was no joy. There was no rejoicing. And I remember we sat down at lunch one time, and um, he, he said, uh, I asked him, I said, um, you know, do you, do, you ever, do you ever experience joy? Do you, do, you just have, do you just rejoice over the fact that you've been forgiven? And he just paused, and he said, well, I just always assumed that would come later. 
And I said, well, are you sure that you have been forgiven? And he said, I'm not. He said, and I can tell you, I can tell you I've done stuff that I don't think God can forgive. And so I said, well, try me. And he said, he was an ex, ex-military, he was a special ops for the Marines, and he just finished a, an, a solo assignment that involved a, a high-ranking operative that he needed to take out. And he described a, what would have otherwise been a successful mission that also involved a, the death of an innocent child civilian. We talked about the moral nature, uh, the difference between a tragic accidental death and the difference between an intent to murder. And as we started talking about that, he just got as light as a feather. And I said to him, Joe, sounds like you're very sensitive that that's that was sin, and now that you think it's not, you're, you're good to go. Joe, what about the rest of your life? What about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And he was totally indifferent. He went from being the morose repentant to the superficial and the glib. There was no fear of God. He actually believed he had nothing to be forgiven of. He left the church and walked away. I, I, I'm just... I'm always concerned about my own heart if my response to sin is lacking conviction or joy. But I want to just step back out here for a second and just wrap this up. Psalm 51, you know why we were here. It's a template for us. These are the fundamentals. This is the fundamentals for what we need to be as a church. It's what we need to benefit from the gospel of Mark. You know, if I can use another sports illustration, I remember growing up, I was a big fan of Michael Jordan, and uh, I remember having his book, Rare Air. I think my sister actually bought it for me. And so I had this book, Rare Air. It's a, it's a great theological resource. That's why I'm using it here as an illustration. <laughs> and, um, and I remember in that, in that book, I, I got to this, there's this page where he's, it has a picture of him with Scottie Pippen, his, his, uh, his uh, teammate, and he's describing what he's looking for in teammates. And he said, you know, he said, give me, give me four other players with average athleticism, but who've mastered the fundamentals, and I'll take them to the court every single time. And I just started thinking about tracing out that illustration on the basketball court. You know, you imagine assembling the five greatest, you know, the, the, the dunk tournament champions, you know, just that can dunk from outside the free, the free throw line, and, but they can't screen, they can't dribble, they can't box out. And you put five guys on the court who can do all the fundamentals and none of them can dunk, and they're going to absolutely annihilate those guys who are of world-class athleticism but don't know anything about the fundamentals. And so as I was thinking about Psalm 51 and the benefit that I want it to be for us as a church, I just kind of started, maybe this isn't sanctified, I started kind of playing like, like you know, like fantasy church, like when you draft your team. <laughs> like I'm thinking like, so what do we, you know, what, what do, we do as, a, as a church? Like what would that look like? And I started thinking like, you know, you could, you could create who, who we are. And I just thought, wow, this is so clarifying, isn't it? You give me a church full of celebrities, intellectuals, the wealthy, the movers and shakers who have control of society, the politicians, the publishing houses, music and movies and the industry. Or, on the other hand, a church of nobodies who mastered the fundamentals of faith and repentance. Give me the fundamentals every single time. This, this is the path to usefulness. This is the only way we can follow Christ on the way. And this is the only way that as a church we're going to be, hold, be able to hold the light of Christ to, to the Phoenix area. And so let's just pray together as we finish here and let's ask the Lord to help us as a church to live out faith and repentance. Lord, we're so thankful for your word and even thankful for this break in Mark and especially as we can devote our time and our attention to um, what it means to live out repentance and faith. Lord, as your people, we, we know that we, we bring nothing to the table. 
Um, you, don't, you don't need anything that we bring. In fact, all that we bring objectively would be the brokenness, the neediness, the lack, the need, the liability. And so we'll gladly acknowledge that with brokenness and contrition, brokenness because of how we've treated you and how, we've, how, how you so richly deserve all the glory. You so richly deserve all of our obedience. If, if every single one of our thoughts about you was 100% worthy of your name, and if every inclination of our soul bent and inclined naturally toward your will, and if every word that came out of our mouth was 100% precisely worthy of you, that wouldn't even be praiseworthy, Lord. That's just what we're supposed to be as your creatures. And so we come before you broken, and we come before you asking to create in us a clean heart, to renew a steadfast spirit. We ask that you would cause our hearts to be so steadfast, so willing, so voluntary, that our service to you would be rich, zealous, white hot, fervent. We ask that as a result of our brokenness, you'd restore sinners to your way, that you would grant repentance through us, that we would never get in the way of the gospel with our own impatience, with our own pride, with our own inflated view of self that would always contaminate an otherwise clear articulation of the message. And for the saints here who are, who've been discouraged, who've been discouraged about the fact that sin is still there and it's still ongoing and the battle does not seem to let up, encourage them with this reality of Psalm 51 that actually their ongoing repentance is the very basis of their usefulness. So Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for how you minister to us through your word. And so we want to sing this praise to you on this Father's Day as opportunity to worship. We pray that this would be acceptable worship, boasting in your righteousness out of the overflow of a heart that knows our need and our lack. In your name we pray. Amen.